So this chapter is on uh, cold and uh, cold injuries. So when you think about uh, cold injuries, cold injuries, you know, essentially they're a type of, uh, it's another type of burn. Uh, the difference is instead of heat, now we're looking at temperature, temperatures that are very, very cool. So, um, you know, when the body experiences heat loss, essentially what's happening is that, uh, you know, at that point or during some duration of time, the body or a body part is surrounded by air or water that's cooler than the body temperature. And normal body temperature is about 37 degrees centigrade or 98.6 Fahrenheit. So when temperature is below that for prolonged periods of time, then we start getting into areas where we may be susceptible to cold related, uh, cold injuries. Uh, so, you know, if the body temperature falls much below this, uh, this range, this temperature, uh, about 37 centigrade or 98.6 Fahrenheit, this is when cold injuries could result. So how does cold affect the body? Well, before we get, get into that, you know, we have to understand that the body has a couple of different uh, internal mechanisms that allow, that allow us to maintain our body temperature. So essentially, the body will go through two things. Uh, one of them is which uh, is a vasoconstriction. Okay, and vasoconstriction is when your blood vessels tighten up. So when the blood vessels tighten up, uh, the effect that it has on on uh, body temperature is that it's conserving heat. So again, your body temperature will will rise. And then the opposite is when you know we have vasodilation. So during vasodilation. Uh, the, the, the blood vessels, they dilate, and thus, we, our body temperature decreases. So, you know, in the context of, um, you know, of this subject, in cold, we're going to essentially end up getting vasoconstriction. Your body's going to, the, the blood vessels will start to uh, constrict in an effort to conserve heat. And of course, the opposite, vasodilation, is when your body uh, temperatures is uh, trying to cool itself off. So the other thing that your body can do to heat itself up, aside from vasoconstrict, uh, vasoconstriction, is when the skeletal muscles start to work. So in that process, which is referred to as shivering, this is the contraction and relaxation of skeletal muscle. So when uh, shivering usually occurs when our body temperature falls between 30 to 32 degrees centigrade. That's about 86 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And we will start to shiver at that point in an effort to uh, increase our uh, core body temperature. So again, both shivering as well as vasoconstriction, uh, these two uh, changes will go into effect to in, in an effort to maintain uh, body temperature. Physical activity also engages the use of skeletal muscles. So again, if you think about it, if you're working out, you're doing any type of uh, exercise, whether it be weightlifting or cardio, or even you know as sim simple as just going to the grocery store or walking long distances, we start to, to sweat. And one of the reasons for, the, for that is, is when skeletal muscles are working, they generate a lot of energy. They generate a lot of heat. So uh, in that process, your body temperature, core temperature also rises. So you know so, uh, the things that people can do if they are stuck or they're in an environment that's cold. Uh, first of all, again, if you <clears throat> decrease your intake of uh, caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol, uh, these can help decrease your susceptibility. Uh, in addition to that, just having proper nutrition and, and hydration can also uh, benefit you. And in addition to that, you know, again, as I said, when you're physically active, then your body generates heat. So if you can decrease the amount of inactivity that you're, that you're uh, enduring, that will also uh, benefit in maintaining a higher core temperature. So as temperatures decrease, heat loss potential also increases. So the, the colder the temperature is, the greater the potential for body heat to escape. So the brain, it ends up signaling blood vessels in our skin to start to tighten. So again, that's your vasoconstriction. So blood flow to the skin starts to decrease. And also at that point, um, your skeletal muscles, they start to contract. They start, in other words, you're, you're shivering, and that's gonna help raise the, the body temperature. 
So um, again, because of the amount of blood that's being decreased to the skin, your temperatures will start to decrease. And um, I'm sorry, your temperatures will start to rise because of the decrease of blood that's flowing to the skin. When the body is exposed to cold for more than an hour, sensations such as touch and pain start to be more blunted. In addition to that, we start to lose our agility as well as dexterity. And overall, you know, a person's ability to perform manual tasks start to be impaired. So our normal body temperature ends up being maintained. Again, it's a balance of heat production and heat loss. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when we start to shiver, our the, our, sorry, our body starts to produce more heat, so it increases heat production. And again, in doing so, we start to consume a lot more calories, so there's l rapid calorie consumption in addition to uh, the amounts of glycogen which start to be depleted. So a lack of food it is also going to limit your ability to generate heat. And you know, uh, essentially when glycogen stores, they start to become depleted, our heat output also starts to, de uh, to, uh, to decrease as, uh, as well. So again, it's important to, to have a proper nutrition of uh, heat loss or the, the, the mechanisms for heat loss. And there's four that's mentioned over here. So the first one is, is um, thermal conduction, or uh, it's also sometimes some people call it heat conduction. And this is just the movement of heat from one object to another one that has a different temperature when they're touching one another. Then we have convection. So convection is a type of heat transfer that only happens in gases and in liquids. So um, it involves liquids and gases that are physically moving. So this happens, convection happens when there is a difference in temperature between two parts of a liquid or two parts of a gas. The next thing that's listed over here is evaporation. And this is a process by which heat is, um, so, let me give an example of evaporation. This is very common. You guys will see this. When you see like a dog panting uh, on a hot summer day, so when a dog sits out, sticks out its tongue and it starts breathing hard, uh, this is called panting. Uh, that moisture on the, on the tongue, it turns into water vapor and then it evaporates. So uh, heat energy is needed to turn a liquid into a gas. So heat is removed from that dog's tongue in that process. Lastly, we have radiation. Radiation is a method of heat transfer that doesn't rely uh, upon any contact between the heat sources uh, and the heated object. Uh, and again, this is what we see in conduction and convec uh, in uh, convention. Uh, I'm sorry, convection. So uh, instead, heat can also be transmitted through empty space by thermal radiation. And this is also sometimes called uh, uh, infrared radiation increase the susceptibility of an individual to uh, any type of a cold injury. One would be, of course, you have age. Uh, so older people and very young people, they're much more susceptible to, susceptible to that, uh, susceptible to cold injuries. Uh, the next thing, you know, that we have to look at are, well, lifestyle factors. So people that are physically unfit, uh, people that may not be very well hydrated, uh, or again, people that are very lean, um, individuals that have uh, higher or high consumptions of caffeine and alcohol, they can also be uh, susceptible to cold injuries. Um, and when you start looking at, uh, you know, you, of course you can look at medical history, so perhaps they have some type of, any type of injuries uh, or an illness or even previous uh, cold injuries. All these, they can uh, increase susceptibility, uh, a person's susceptibility to cold injuries. So when air temperatures drops uh, two degrees every 305 meters, uh, this also has an effect on our body to maintain uh, maintain its uh, core temperature. So uh, when we have, um, as it's in other words, when we were talking about when we're starting to to go up. Uh, a big hill or a mountain as you start to gain altitude temperature will start to drop as well uh, winds again when winds are more severe this also have has effects on the, on the, uh, the body maintaining its temperature um, when you start going to elevations that are high 
So again, we're talking about um, elevations that are more than about more than 2,400 meters. At that point, frostbite it becomes much more common, and we will be talking about what frostbite is, and we'll look at some pictures of this as well because there's a couple of different types. The next thing that we want to look at uh, is the the effects of water. So water it conducts heat away from the body. So if you, you know, an individual plunges a body part or again, they plunge their entire body into the water, which is um, w what we would expect, uh, that means, you know, this could end up causing, again, when the entire body is immersed in a cold, a cold body of water, it would cause an irregular heartbeat. In addition to that, it will have effects on the person's breathing abilities. So they'll start gasping for air or in addition to that, hyperventilation. Also, there could be inhalation of water. This could also result in, you know, that irregular heartbeat. It, it could also result in uh, heart failure. And of course, you know, there is a risk of drowning. So, um, again, when we talk about winds and, you know, the effects of wind, so wind increases heat loss from the skin uh, when it's exposed to cold air. And, uh, you know, you have to also look at wind chill. So wind chill is just the combined effect of the ambient temperature and the speed at which the wind is moving, or the, the air is moving, which is wind. So wind speed and uh, uh, the ambient temperature, when you combine these, this is what's referred to as wind chill. So for example, you know, on a day uh, where the temperature might be, I don't know, 5 degrees centigrade or... Um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and then you have 20 miles per hour winds. Well, then, you know, they say, you know, the, the, the wind chill, or the it feels like, so that's another term that they use, the feel-like temperature. It feels like minus 5, or it feels like uh, 20 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So the effects of metals and uh, liquid fuels, so... Uh, yeah, metals and liquid fuels, they could conduct heat away from the skin rather quickly. Uh, alcohol also cools down fever. So perhaps you may remember when you were younger, uh, or you may have seen it on, on a movie or a documentary. Sometimes, uh, again, usually you'll see this in children when they end up having fevers. A mom, the mother, she'll take, uh, or a nurse, will take a, a handkerchief or a, a cloth, submerge it in, in alcohol and then put it on the forehead, uh, under the axilla, or on the feet to help decrease uh, the body temperature. So again, al alcohol, essentially, it helps, uh, it uh, removes uh, heat, so it helps cool down the core temperature. Uh, and another thing is, you know, in, on like very hot days um, in, the, in the summer, if you have a car and uh, it's been sitting, you parked it outside for a couple hours, two, three hours, and again, it's underneath the sun. So if you go touch the steering wheel, it's extremely hot. So one trick that some people use, and you know they even sell this as products, is that you know they sell us a, a bottle, and in that bottle there is some alcohol in it, and probably some type of a fragrance. You spray it on the spring wheel, uh, on the steering wheel, and then it just you know the temperature cools down where you don't feel it hot anymore. You don't burn your hand. So. Um, Yes, alcohol also. It's, so again, alcohol, this is just showing how quickly alcohol can decrease uh, temperatures. The other thing is uh, contact. So contact can cause near instantaneous freezing. Uh, contact with uh, metals and uh, liquid fuels can uh, freeze instantly. So when you look over here, essentially, <clears throat> how do you minimize the effect of uh, you know, decreasing your core temperature quickly? Well. If you look at this photograph here, essentially it kind of sp says a lot. Uh, you have to start wearing layers. So when you look at uh, the inner layer, the inner layer of clothing, in this case, you know, it's going to end up removing perspiration. So as we uh, start to sweat, that inner layer, your undershirt or it's a thermal uh, Nike, they have this climax, it ends up helping removing away that, that moisture. Then the middle air, it starts to insulate. It starts to retain whatever body heat that you, the, the heat that your body has, it will retain that. And then the outer layer, this is the protective layer. This is what's protecting you against the elements. And specifically, we're talking about protecting against uh, wind in this case. Okay, wind and then also uh, external 
uh, environmental factors such as snow or, or rain or anything else that might be out there. Non-freezing injuries, non-freezing cold injuries can occur when conditions are cold and wet. So when you're looking at your hands and feet, they can't be kept warm and dry. These could result in non-freezing cold injuries. Chillblains are the painful inflammation of small blood vessels in the skin that happen in response to repeated exposure to cold but not freezing air. Uh, another term for this is perneal, P-E-R-N-I-O, perneal. So uh, chillblains, they can cause itching, red patches, swelling, and even blistering on your hands and feet. So what do you look for? Again, um, inflammation, swollen skin, skin that's tender, uh, hot to the touch, and also sometimes it could be, it may possibly be, be uh, itchy as well. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, formation of blisters. Uh, there could be a prickly sensation or numbness or even aching that's present. So what do you do? Get the person out of the cold. Remove the person from that environment. environment. Take them into a controlled environment. So again, take them to a warmer, uh, warmer location. The next thing is something called trench foot. Trench foot develops when the skin on the foot is exposed to moisture and cold for 12 hours or more. And this could be caused by wearing wet, boot, wet boots or shoes, uh, or, or again, even just having your foot uh, in, uh, immersed in, in, uh, in the cold water for, for long times. Uh, it's cold and moisture, it affects the skin. And then again, it ends up causing tissue loss, and then which could end up resulting to infection. So again, when you look at trench foot, you may have seen this. Perhaps, you know, if you stay in the swimming pool for you know, half a day, like you might do in, in the summer. So again, what do we have? Uh, we start to have itching, numbness, tingling pain, swollen feet, or pale, pale skin. And if you touch it, you know, it's, it's cold as well. Uh, or on other times, you might see uh, discoloration, such as red or blue blotches on the skin. And sometimes we may even have uh, open or weeping bleeding that uh, may result. So what do you do for trench foot? How do you treat this? Well, you know, you want, first of all, you want to keep uh, the skin dry, so you dry up the skin. And then gradually, you want to rewarm the foot. Uh, if there's weeping areas, how do you care for that? Again, you want to remember, one of the, the risks is infection. So you want to use uh, mild soap and water to, to clean that area. And you know, after that, you want to apply a breathable dressing to that to the areas where there is either weeping or bleeding that's occurring. So when you look over here, what do we have going on over here? So this describes different type of uh, injuries, different type of freezing cold injuries. So again, this happens when the air temperature is below freezing. So there's a couple of different terms that you see over here: frost nip and frost bite. So, frost nip is limited to the skin surface, whereas frost bite extends into the flesh. Okay, so we're talking about something that's very superficial to that, that just starts to, it, and you know, it starts to go deeper uh, into tissue. So the more tissue that's involved, again, this is more uh, referred to as frost bite. So, and this is just very superficial uh, skin injuries just the top part of the skin so this is what uh, frost nip would be compared to frostbite where there's much more deeper types of uh, skin involvement so again this photograph over here uh, this one over here shows you what frost nip uh, may appear like if you look over here there may be blistering that, that's present but again usually you might find this sometimes and you may not find this so again, frost nip is caused when water on the skin, uh, on the skin surface, freezes. This is essentially one of the causes for frost nip. Um, when you look over here, what do you look for? So as we saw in the previous, uh, in this photo over here, you look for changes uh, in the uh, color of the skin. So you know there could be yellow or gray skin color. Uh, there may even be frost that, that you see present on the skin. 
in, this, in, in addition to that, there is an, uh, usually there's tingling sensation. After that, there may, it may result in numbness, and then over time, it may start to become painful. So what do you do? Again, you want to get that person out of the cold, gently warm that affected area. Uh, and one of the things is, you know, you do not, you do not want to rub that affected uh, area. That's something that you don't want to do. You want to avoid that. Now, when you look over here, frostbite. Now, there's two ways of uh, damage for frostbite. First of all, there's tissue freezing, and the other is obstruction of blood supply to that tissue. So two ways for, for, for this to result. Frostbite usually will, again, this also extre uh, affects the extremities. So we're talking about feet, hand, uh, ears, and nose are the most susceptible to frostbite injuries. Now, what do we look for? Okay, so again, this is before you um, start thawing. What do you do? What do you start to look for? So, um, not what to do, I'm sorry. What, do, what are you looking for? What are the, some of the signs that you'll, you may or may not see? So again, it varies from person to person, from case to case. So there may be white, waxy, or grayish yellowing of the skin. Uh, you know, the, the body parts, they may feel very cold. And if you ask them about sensation, they may say that it's numb. They could say it's tingling, stinging, or it may be even achy. Uh, in terms of palpation, when you palpate the skin, again, as I said, it may feel cold. But also it could feel stiff or the skin may even be crusty. Uh, the underlying tissue is going to be soft. Now, for deep, by the way, so this is a superficial frostbite, okay? So a superficial frostbite. For deep frostbite, now there's a lot more tissue that's involved. So uh, in deep frostbite, uh, you're gonna start to, again, you will see discoloration. So there could be pale, uh, even black, charred looking waxy skin. So the, the, the parts feel cold, they'll be hard and solid. You can't, so if you start, if you try to squeeze them, you, you won't be able to, to depress them. They can't be depressed, Again, they're frozen essentially. And uh, this could be painful. Over time, what ends up happening is that, again, as the nerves start to become damaged, they start to lose sensation. So what do you do? when there's frost, frostbite, okay, before you start thawing. First of all, again, you want to remove that person from the, that environment. So uh, get the person to a warm area, climate control. Remove wet clothing uh, and, and items that may be constricting. So again, remember, constricting items, in other words, when if they have a watch that's too tight or even a ring, that constriction is going to further decrease blood flow and that you know decrease blood flow, uh, it's going to end up cooling the temperature down. So again, remember, you want to warm up the body parts slowly. So don't attempt to thaw, uh, thaw out the part if, um, you know, if uh, medical care is it's less than, two, in other words, if you can take them to a doctor's office or an emergency room and it's less than two hours away, don't start to thaw it out. Take them and uh, they need professional treatment at that point. Uh, if that affected area has already thawed out, do not try and thaw it out even more. Uh, if there isn't warm water, uh, a shelter, or some type of a container that's, uh, that isn't available, then this is when you don't want to thaw it out. Again, you have to do this in a, in a controlled environment. Uh, you, if you don't have warm water, do, don't, do not do that. You, know? no, you don't want to use other, because other items, they may be too hot. And again, the process of thawing should be gradual. You shouldn't be shocking uh, the, the body part or the affected area or an entire body from you know, cold temperature to, to hot very fast. It should happen slowly. You want to use the, the wet, rapid rewarming method if medical care is more than two hours away. So you're more than two hours away from a doctor's office or an emergency room, or there's no possibility of refreezing. And also if you have access to warm water, shelter, and a container. Uh, if the wet, rapid rewarming method is not possible, uh, you want to try to use slow rewarming instead. Now, how do we do this? You want to place the, the, the body part in warm water and you want to maintain that water temperature. So this usually takes, this needs to be done, remember, slowly. So uh, between 20 to 40 minutes, you're gradually uh, warming up uh, the, the, the temperature 
for that body area, body part. Uh, you want to air dry that area. You don't want to rub. Again, when there is, um, if there's any pain that's involved, uh, at that point, again, for pain, you want to give use analgesic. So you can use an, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, an NSAID. Uh, that should help as well. Um, and you know, for for example, if it's a, uh, the, the ears or the face, if there's any injuries there, you know, you want to apply some warm cloths to those areas. So let's take a look at what uh, some of the signs uh, we may see for different type of um, uh, injuries, different type of frostbite. So. Uh, like burns, this also gets classified into first, second, and third degree. So in the first degree, usually you'll see, uh, first degree frostbite, you'll see warm, uh, swollen, and, and tender, for example. It could be fingertip, fingertips, or it could, could be uh, the, the, the ears or nose that's involved, or toes. Uh, in second degree, we will see blisters that form, and uh, they start to get bigger over the course of, uh, of days. Uh, in third degrees, you know, you may or you may not see blisters and you will see a discoloration of reddish to blue or even purple fluid that may be coming out. Um, it may, the skin probably will not be blanching. And, uh, you know, and a lot of times we'll also start to see, uh, again, that this blue to a dark, like a black colored uh, tone to the skin. When we look at... Um, Again, so for feet, what do you do? For feet, we do not want that person to walk, so we don't want to aggravate the injury any further. We want to protect the area from contact with the environment. You can take some uh, dry gauze and place it between the toes or, or, in, in the, the, or the fingers for that matter. Try to keep this, the body part slightly elevated. Uh, something else that works very well, again, something that we discuss for burns, is that you can apply aloe vera gel. In addition to that, again, just to help with uh, the pain, analgesics such as an NSAID could be given. Uh, and also, you want to keep this individual hydrated. So give them water to drink or uh, something with electrolytes. And of course, you want to seek professional care, medical care. When we're talking about hypothermia, we are talking about a life-threatening condition in which the body's core temperature falls below 35 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Now, the heartbeat, uh, I'm sorry, it should be 35 degrees centigrade, not Fahrenheit. This is what hypothermia would be, 35 degrees centigrade. So heart beating, there may be present or the heart beating, it may be undetected. So. There may be a detectable or an undetectable uh, heartbeat. In addition to that, the same thing for respiration. So breathing may be detected or it could be, it may be undetected. All right, uh, continuing with hypo, uh, continuing with the, uh, with hypothermia. Uh, in terms of the types of, uh, of heat exposure that may be present, uh, present we can talk about acute. So when there's acute exposure, we're talking about um, six hours or less in terms of duration, and usually this involves uh, water. Subacute durations, again, it's between six to 24 hours. So it is under 24 hours, but greater than 24 hours. However, this not only may involve water, but it could also be, it could also involve land conditions, land terrain as well. Chronic exposure to to uh, to cold. This usually this will occur on land, and this the duration will exceed more than 24 hours. So we're talking about greater than 24 hours of exposure uh, for chronic cold. In looking at some of the symptoms for hypothermia, you may see a change in a person's mental status. In addition to that, we can look for sympathetic responses such as shivering. Uh, if you Palpate, you may find a cold or cool abdomen in addition to uh, a low core body temperature. Other things to consider, all right, uh, based on uh, the core body temperature, uh, in severe cases, again, if shivering stops, do not start CPR. So if the core body temperature is below 15.5 degrees Fahrenheit, 
uh, or if, again, if the chest is frozen, or if the individual has been submerged in water for more than uh, more than an hour, so more than 60 minutes. Uh, other times, again, if there is lethal injury, some type of a lethal injury that exists, uh, or, you know, you do not want to start CPR, okay? Um, and of course, you know, if you are endangered in any way, you do not want to start CPR either. So consider all these things before uh, beforehand. So do not start uh, CPR until after you have checked the person's circulation for at least a minute. Now remember, when body temperatures decrease, you're, you're going to find the heart rate also decreases significantly. Even the uh, breathing, respiration also decreases, where they may, to the point that, where they may be taking perhaps uh, six breaths a minute. And the heart rate may be as slow as 30 beats um, per minute. So again, when you're, first of all, again, if when you remember, you for yourself, if you're out in the cold and you're trying to feel a pulse, when you t remove your gloves and your hands, your fingers are exposed to that cold, your sensation will, will also be, will be dulled. So it may take you more effort to be able to feel for a pulse in addition to when you combat it with uh, touching a cool skin uh, of that of your victim and uh, it or if it's thawed is you're gonna you know you're gonna be much less sensitive in in feeling uh, that pulse uh, in addition to that again just that rate because it's it's low and and uh, until you find the proper area to feel for that pulse in, in other words when you get underneath that artery uh, then all of that is going to decrease, you know, the time that uh, it's going to be able to take you. I'm sorry, it's going to increase the time it's going to take you to be able to detect for a pulse. So again, you want to wait at least a minute. So uh, if there's no detectable pulse, or again, respiration is after a minute, then you want to start CPR. Uh, again, CPR it could it can be delayed. Or it could be given intermittently, or again, you can give it for several hours again just because that individual's core temperature is low you know there's you, you can do it for a much greater time hopefully until ems arrives and you know they can be taken to a controlled uh, environment and um, again receive uh, higher level care so for mild hypothermia what do you look for uh, so for mild hypothermia cool or cold skin on the abdomen chest or back as well in addition to that, uh, you want to look for uh, body temperatures between uh, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 32.2 degrees centigrade. So, uh, th this is what uh, some of the uh, the things that uh, you'll be you know so, uh, the signs and symptoms you'll be able to observe for uh, a mild case of hypothermia. When we go to um, you know treatment options, you know, what do you do for mild hypothermia? So again, it's more or less the same what we discussed earlier. For the most part, again, you want to try to stop further heat from being lost. Uh, you can apply heat to the chest, armpits, and, and the back. Again, remember what we said in the previous slide. This is the areas where you will feel uh, the skin cold, you know, will be the abdomen, the chest and back. So if the abdomen, chest and back is cold, then try to apply some warm heat there. Uh, you can also try warming uh, the lower arms and legs. Uh, temperature range you want to do for that about 41.6 to 45 degrees centigrade. So that's about 107 to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the other thing is, you know, give them something warm to drink, like you know, a warm cup of tea or a warm cup of uh, coffee, something sugary also, you know, to, to help. Uh, uh, again, you want to them to start shivering again for that to happen the skeletal muscles need some glucose and the sugar will help uh, uh, take care of that that will help with that uh, now in severe hypothermia what are you looking for in severe hy hypothermia you're looking for rigid and stiff muscles we're not going to see any shivering present so there, there, there will be an absence of shivering the skin it will feel ice cold and it will it is even going to appear blue uh, the mental status will be altered or they may not be alert at all. As far as the heart rate, it's going to be slow as well as the respirations. In looking at some of the symptoms for hypothermia, you may see a change in a person's mental status. 
In addition to that, we can look for sympathetic responses such as shivering. Uh, if you palpate, you may find a cold or cool abdomen in addition to uh, a low core body temperature. Other things to consider, all right, uh, based on uh, the core body temperature, uh, in severe cases, again, if shivering stops, do not start CPR. So if the core body temperature is below 15.5 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or if, again, if the chest is frozen, or if the individual has been submerged in water for more than, uh, more than an hour, so more than 60 minutes, uh, other times, again, if there is lethal injury, some type of a lethal injury that exists, uh, or, you know, you do not want to start CPR, okay? Um, and of course, you know, if you are endangered in any way, you do not want to start CPR either. So consider all these things before uh, beforehand. So do not start uh, CPR until after you have checked the person's circulation for at least a minute. Now remember, when body temperatures decrease, you're, you're going to find the heart rate also decreases significantly. Even uh, breathing, respiration also decreases where they may, to the point that where they may be taking perhaps uh, six breaths a minute. And the heart rate may be as slow as 30 beats um, per minute. So again, when you're First of all, again, if when you remember, you for yourself, if you're out in the cold and you're trying to feel a pulse, when you t remove your gloves and your hands, your fingers are exposed to that cold, your sensation will, will also be will be dulled. So it may take you more effort to be able to feel for a pulse. In addition to when you combat it with uh, touching a cool skin uh, of that of your victim. And uh, it, or if it's thawed, is you're gonna, have, you know, you're gonna be much less sensitive in in feeling uh, that pulse. Uh, in addition to that, again, just that rate because it's it's low, and and uh, until you find the proper area to feel for that pulse, and in other words, when you get underneath that artery, uh, then all of that is gonna decrease, you know, the time that uh, it's gonna be able to take you. I'm sorry, it's gonna increase the time it's gonna take you to be able to detect for a pulse. So again, you want to wait at least a minute. So uh, if there's no detectable pulse, or again, respiration is after a minute, then you want to start CPR. Uh, again, CPR, it, could, it can be delayed, it could be given intermittently, or again, you can give it for several hours again, just because that individual's core temperature is low, you know, there's, you, you can do it for a much greater time, hopefully until EMS arrives and, you know, they can be taken to a controlled uh, environment and um, again receive uh, higher level care. So for mild hypothermia, what do you look for? Uh, so for mild hypothermia, cool or cold skin on the abdomen, chest or back as well. In addition to that, uh, you want to look for body temperatures between uh, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 32.2 degrees centigrade. So. Uh, th this is what uh, some of the uh, the things that uh, you'll be you know so, uh, the signs and symptoms you'll be able to observe for uh, a mild case of hypothermia. When we go to um, you know treatment options, you know, what do you do for mild hypothermia? So again, it's more or less the same what we discussed earlier. For the most part, again, you want to try to stop further heat from being lost. Uh, you can apply heat to the chest, armpits, and, and the back. Again, remember what we said in the previous slide. This is the areas where you will feel uh, the skin cold. You know, will be the abdomen, the chest, and back. So, if the abdomen, chest, and back is cold, then try to apply some warm heat there. Uh, you can also try warming uh, the lower arms and legs. Uh, temperature range you want to do for that about forty-one. 0.6 to 45 degrees centigrade, so that's about 107 to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the other thing is, you know, give them something warm to drink, like, you know, a warm cup of tea or a warm cup of uh, coffee, something sugary also, you know, to, to help, uh, uh, again, you want to them to start shivering, again, for that to happen, the skeletal muscles need some glucose and the sugar will help uh, uh, take care of that, that will help with that. 
Uh, now, in severe hypothermia, what are we looking for? In severe hy hypothermia, you're looking for rigid and stiff muscles. We're not going to see any shivering present. So there, there, there will be an absence of shivering. The skin, it will feel ice cold and it will, it is even going to appear blue. Uh, the mental status will be altered or they may not be alert at all. As far as the heart rate, it's going to be slow as well as the respirations. And the person may appear to look dead. So what do we do for treating hypothermia? Well, the first thing that you want to do is you want to remove the person's wet clothes. Clothes, And the best way to do this is just by cutting it off. Why is that the case? Well, when your clothes get wet, they become tight. And when, again, when you have an emergency, you don't want to be struggling for three, four, five, ten minutes trying to take off someone's, you know, shirt or, or their pants for that matter. Uh, so again, if you have uh, scissors laying around or you have any, some type of an instrument that you can use to cut away the clothing, go ahead and do that right away. That's going to save a lot of time. And uh, also, it's going to prevent it from getting stuck. Sometimes, you know, when you're trying to remove wet clothes, you can actually make it worse by, um, you know, having the clothes get stuck at a, sp a specific point. And now you've got, you've created another problem. Why? Because, you know, when clothes become stuck, now you're further restricting blood flow. The, patient, the, your, uh, the victim already has a decrease of blood going to extremities because of the, the cold. Now that... You know, you have like a, essentially a tourniquet that's tied around some specific limb. You're further reducing the amount of blood flow. So, you know, you're complicating matters. So uh, instead of getting yourself into that situation, just cut the clothes off. Of course, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Uh, monitor the breathing. Give CPR uh, if it's necessary. And, you know, you want to be sure you allow enough time, at least a minute, before you start uh, to you know, initiate CPR. So remember, we discussed this earlier. Always keep in mind, when the heart rate is low, when the respirations are low, it takes a much longer time for you to make an observation, for you to detect these. So this is why you need to wait much longer. Now, uh, whatever the number is in your area for emergency medical services, use that to call. Uh, if it's 112, call 112 to activate, to get an, uh, a paramedic to come out or a doctor or if it's 911 or whatever the, the number is in your, uh, in your area. Use that to activate the emergency medical services. So what are some of the problems we have for rewarming? Well, warm water immersion requires a lot of warm water and a bathtub. So if you don't have a bathtub or some type of a container where that's large enough for a body to be submerged in, then this is not going to be practical. You're not going to be able to do this. So again, you're limited to the equipment that you have av available to you. Body-to-body -body contact in, insulated, in an insulated um, sleeping bag is not better than shivering, but again, it, it is... It has been shown to be helpful, and again, it can save a life. So uh, if this is an option, then you, know, this may, you may need to be able to do this for, some, for someone to save a life. Now, sometimes you may not have access to this, any one of these, and, uh, or perhaps you have access to chemical heating pads. So there is no evidence that suggests that chemical heating pads are capable of rewarming a hypothermic individual. However, again, if um, there's nothing else available and this is all that you're able to do at this point in time, then, you know, you may, you know, trying something is better than doing nothing. One thing that a lot of people do not consider is that, um, you know, in the wintertime or whenever you're in a cold environment, that um, you aren't losing any fluids, you're not lo losing any wa water. Well, you know, this is because... This is what we refer to as unperceived fluid loss. So, in other words, we don't have any perception of sweating. You know, when we're sweating, uh, we don't. We do not realize this. So, um, again, dehydration in winter time, it results from unperceived fluid loss, in, uh, combined with inadequate fluid intake. 
you get so off at the metro bus stop or drinking enough you get off food, at a subway stop and then you combine that mass transit station and you need to walk food loss a few hundred meters you end up you getting know, dehydrated maybe four or five so blocks to give an example for example you get off of a to wherever you're working at well you know when it's cold you want to go from one place to the next rather quickly so you're going to try to move as fast as you can now while you're doing that again your muscles are working your skeletal muscles are, are, are working to to get you to go from one place to the next so what's happening heat's being generated as that heat is being generated again it's going to try and cool itself so your body is still producing sweat. Again, this is unperceived fluid loss. In addition to that, when you're breathing, when you look outside, you know, what do you see in the winter time when you blow out uh, air from your mouth? You see smoke coming out. That's not smoke, what looks like smoke, you know, that's vapor. So again, fluid is also lost through breathing, through your breath. So what do you do? Well, even in, in the cold, winter month, months, you have to drink enough fluid. Even when you're not thirsty, you need to drink enough uh, fluid. The other thing is you want to monitor. Monitor the, the color of both the color of your urine and also the volume of urine. So if your urine appears very concentrated, it's very dark, and you're not urinating enough, that's an indication that you, know, you may be dehydrated or slightly dehydrated. Uh, now, one other thing to consider is if you are out in a remote location, maybe you know, you've know you gone hiking somewhere, or you're out in, in you know some very rural area, do not start eating or melting snow and ice to drink for fluids. That's, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get enough. And the other thing is, especially these days with all these, these pathogens that are circulating, you don't want to take a chance uh, of, of picking something up. That's very, very unlikely that th that will happen. But again, uh, you don't want to drink very cold water. Again, when it's cold outside, you don't want to drink colder water. So at least try to drink water that's at room temperature at the very least. Uh, so that is all for this, uh, for this chapter.